Well, good morning, church. It is a blessing to be with you all today. It is uh, is telling my wife on the way up here, as I often do, it's one of my favorite churches to serve uh, through the pulpit ministry. One, because I love you all so much, and I love the area so much, but this has got to be the coolest pulpit I've ever preached behind. (laughs) As a as a pulpit thug, someone who preaches in a lot of churches, you you start to rate the pulpits, and you just kind of do it subconsciously. And this one, this one's up there. I gotta say, this one is pretty high up there. If you would please turn in your Bibles to the book of Philippians, we're going to be in chapter four, looking at verses eight and nine. Philippians chapter four. Verses 8 and 9. And while you're turning there, let me commit our time in the Word to the Lord. Father, we thank you so much for the blessing of your Word. We thank you for your sovereignty in giving it to us, handing it down through the generations, preserving it perfectly. Father, we thank you for who you are. Father, we thank you for the gospel. Father, as we dig into your word this morning, we pray, as has already been been asked of you, that you will help all of us to hear what it is you would have us hear and to apply to our hearts the truths of Scripture. As we hear from your servant Paul this morning to the church in Philippi and an extension, the church here in Cedar Woolley, We ask your grace and your mercy and the grace to be able to apply what it is you want us to apply. Father, I pray what my brothers and sisters hear from me this morning is all of your spirit, nothing of me. We ask this in our Savior's name, Jesus. Amen. All right, Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. This is what it says. It says, finally, brothers... Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Well, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God endures forever. If you are like me, and I hope some of you are, your emotions can heavily affect your actions. And if you're even further like me, you find that your emotions, how you feel in the moment, are heavily affected by your thinking. I can make a very, very easy correlation between the thoughts that I have in my head versus the emotions and the way that I feel. And then those two things combined usually result in how I then act. And it's not a link that I think many connect, but I think it's something that we would be wise as Christians to connect more often in our lives. By ways of an example, I can remember dealing with this to the extreme almost in high school in that I remember uh, being a freshman and a sophomore in high school and being on the wrestling team. And I know looking at me, my height and stature, you think all-star basketball player, but I'm just trying to break stereotypes, trying to break some ground here, right? I was on the wrestling team. um, And I remember having such a visceral reaction to getting warmed up for the wrestling match. And if any of you have ever wrestled, I don't know if any of you have, but it can be scary, especially when you're a freshman and sophomore in high school and you're wrestling junior and seniors. There's a lot of physical development that happens from freshman year to senior year. It's just a fact. And I can remember very vividly Warming up with my little hoodie and my ear, in my 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 uh, my uh, headphones in, and 
you know, warming up and looking across the mat trying to figure out, okay, who is it that I'm going to wrestle? Who looks like they're in my weight class, right? And it was always the big buff guy. Always. It was always the guy that had arms the size of my thighs. And, and I would be looking and, and I would get anxious. And I would be scared. And I'd psych myself out to the point of having to go into the locker room and, and lose what very little I had in my stomach because I was so anxious. I was so scared and my thinking took over my body and my body did what it decided it was going to do. And I struggled with this for so long, so long. And it didn't occur to me then, but looking back now I can see how in that moment I was not doing the the, the hard work of bringing into captivity my thinking, of applying the truths that I know to my situation, and my mind was allowed to race and then take over my body, and then everything was just awful at that point. The point is that our emotions are very closely tied to our thought life, and because of this, it's very important with, uh, with what we as Christians bring into our minds. It's very important what we allow ourselves to be influenced by, what we hear, what we see. I'm reminded of that, that kid song, Oh, be careful, little mind, what you see, what you hear, what you think. And we tell our kids this because we understand that our kids are sponges, Right? They just soak in so much. And anyone who's a parent understands the effect that different individuals, environments, TV shows can have on your kids. They start emulating the things that they see. And you know what? We're no different. We are no different. It might be a little bit more subtle for us who are adults but it becomes very difficult because of that for us to see the blind spots in our own life, things that we are being affected by in ways that we might not even understand. The input will affect the output, and what fills the time will fill the thoughts, and what fills the thoughts will fill the speech and the actions. That's how it works. And this isn't a principle that we outgrow simply because we're not children anymore. Like I said, the issues can become much more subtle and harder to identify because they're not as blatant. But again, if you are like me, you're stubborn and you don't enjoy having those blind spots identified either by you or even worse, by others. And the places that we need accountability or change become harder to locate the longer that we ignore them. Because of this, church, it is vital that we take inventory as Christians constantly of the things that we are allowing into our heads, the things that we are, that we are choosing to dwell on, choosing to give our time because the simple truth is this, we are all discipled by something. And the thing that you give the most time in your life, the most devotion to, will be your closest disciple. That's just how it's going to work. It will disciple you one way or another. So for context, where we find ourselves here is that Paul had just finished speaking to the Philippians about overcoming anxiety, right? Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It's something that I love about the Apostle Paul, and he's, he, he's flawless to do this, is that he never, ever just stops with the theology, he provides the theology because he understands it's important that we, that we understand the deep truths of Scripture and why we do things, but he never stops there. 
He always takes it to the correct next step, and that is what should, how should we then live as Christians? Our theology, the things that we know about Scripture, the things that we know about God, it must lead to action. It's orthodoxy and orthopraxy. The orthodoxy is the things that we know. The orthopraxy is us putting into practice the orthodoxy. So theology is wonderful and vital, but if we are not allowing that theology to then change the way that we act, change the way that we think, we are not engaging in it correctly. If Scripture be our authority... Our lives, our thoughts, our speech, our actions must be ruled by it and nothing else. It should be our sole authority as Christians. And if you want to bring your emotions, your anxiety, the things that we deal with as humans on a daily basis under subjection, we must start with using this barometer that Paul gives us here in Philippians with how to do that. He begins in verse 8. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true. Now, we're not going to be able to do as much of a deep dive in all of these things that Paul is going to give us as much as I'd like to for the sake of time. But we're going to cover each one to the best of our ability. And Paul starts with stating the things that we must be dwelling on as Christians if we want our minds and our actions, our emotions to come into greater conformity to the word of God, the person of Jesus Christ, he says the first and foremost thing is it must be true. This might seem obvious, but church, we live in a world today where truth has become relative and subject to the opinions of everyone who has an opinion. We live in a world today where you can believe what you want to believe. Your truth is your truth. My truth is my truth. And I can't speak truth into your truth. Truth becomes something that is a flippant uh, word that is thrown around carelessly without any real definition, without any real anchor. But the truth is we must have a standard. There must be a standard if something is to be true. And we as Christians believe that the standard for all truth is the word of God. That is the standard by which we live our lives. That is the standard by which we call others to repentance. That is the standard by which we filter everything in this culture through the question, the important question, what does the Bible say? If we live in lies, our life will reflect the lives that we are living in. We must be people of truth. The things that we choose to dwell on must be true. And scripture is our barometer, our anchor and our source for understanding what is true and what is false. Does it contradict what the Bible says? If yes, the answer is false. Is it in line with Scripture, in line with the precepts laid down by our God? Then it is true and worthy to be dwelled on. Next, Paul says, whatever is honorable. Honorable can be defined as something that is worthy of high respect or great esteem or an adherence to what is right. And it begs the question, how do we as God's people judge and determine whether something is honorable or dishonorable? Well, we go back to the very first thing. Is it true? Does it line up with the standard of God's word? If it does, then it is honorable. Without the standard of truth, none of the following things that Paul gives are able to be actually truly defined, and that's why Paul started with truth. What does the Bible hold as honorable? What does the Bible hold as worthy of esteem? What does God say 
is worthy of praise? Does it bring honor to God? All of these questions as we, as we determine whether something is worthy of honor, worthy of giving our respect, worthy of giving our esteem, these questions must be asked. Paul goes on to say, whatever is just. And this is an interesting one because I think the concept of justice in 2022 America is a very far and removed definition than what scripture gives. And I think that we have seen here specifically in the country that we live an incorrect application of what is just. Justice is a very important aspect of how we are to evaluate things as Christians. Does it line up with the law of God? Primary. Because the justice, in order for something to be just, it must stem from the law that God has laid down. And we as Christians have been given the authority. We have been given the law of God. Jesus didn't come to abolish the law. He came to fulfill it. And even though he fulfilled it, does not mean that the law of God simply goes away. The law of God is something that is important for us as Christians to know, to live our lives according to its precepts. Obviously not living, living in the law in order to justify ourselves. We confess wholeheartedly that Jesus Christ fulfills the law perfectly for us. We confess we are unable to keep the law perfectly, but it does not mean that we simply throw the law away because it has been fulfilled on our behalf. We are duty-bound to follow the law of of God. How do we know if something is just or unjust? Go to the truth. And what's important to understand, especially within the last few years that we have had, is that the laws of men that are created in any country are subject to the law of God. And that there will be times in our lives as Christians when we are called to both submit to the laws of men because they are in line with God's word and, and, and obeying these set of laws that we have in, in, in whatever country we find ourselves living in is not contrary to the word of God. And I believe in those situations, we are called to submit. However, there are times when the laws of men begin to creep closer and closer to the line of defiling the law of God and begin to overtake the law of God and begin to say things that are contrary to the law of God. And it is at that point where we as Christians must, in all graciousness and all humility, plant our flag in the dirt and say, it's the standard of God that I am called to live by, first and foremost and primary. All other laws, all other governments, all other people fall subject to the law of God. And that is something that every church, every elder team, every congregant, every Christian this year has had to do war with their conscience and the word of God to decide where those lines are. And we've seen lots of different answers. But the point is, when we talk about justice, what is right, what is true, I see that often the law of God, the precepts laid in his word, are often thrown out. And it is something that I desperately, desperately wish for the church to recover. Psalm 119, starting in... Verse 97, the psalmist says this, he says, Oh, how I love your law. It is my meditation all the day. Your commandments <clears throat> make me wiser than my enemies, for it is ever with me. I have more understanding than all my teachers, for your testimonies are my meditation. I understand more than the aged, for I keep your precepts. I hold back my feet from every evil in order to keep your word. 
I do not turn aside from your rules, for you have taught me. How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Though your precept, through your precepts I get understanding, therefore I hate every false way. The law of God should be sweet, especially to those that know it has been fulfilled for them in Jesus Christ. Justice comes from the law of God, and on his law we are called as Christians to meditate day and night. <clears throat> Paul then switches his focus and says we are, as Christians are called to dwell on whatever is pure whatever is pure whatever is morally right whatever is clean spotless without blemish to be clear purity is only something that can come from God and his word very clearly shows what is pure. We are called as Christians to have purity in our thoughts, in our speech, in our motives, and in our actions. And this is something that I find difficult for me to do in times of frustration. It is very difficult for me to keep my thoughts pure. And by pure, I mean not angry not overly frustrated, not cursing those that have, uh, in my estimation, created the circumstance that I am in. There's lots of ways that our minds and our emotions can be directed away from purity. And Paul says that one of the remedies for that is to be dwelling not on what is impure, but on what is pure. And there is a great link between the term purity and the term holiness. Holiness means to be set apart. It means to be, to be different because of, of what it is, its substance. When we're speaking uh, ultimately about the holiness of God, he is set apart from all darkness, from all sin, from all things that, that, have, uh, that, are, that are filthy and with blemish. To be holy, to be pure, means to be set apart from those. It's setting that barrier in your mind from things that you know cause your mind to drift. Whether this, this be situational things, like I was talking about before, where you struggle with anger, or you struggle with selfishness, you struggle with gossip, whether it be sexual sin, Setting those barriers and those walls that you know are there to protect you, to keep the thoughts pure, to be dwelling on what is pure. Purity will look very different in a world that is so defiled. And it will be things that shine the light into the darkness, the darkness of our mind, the darkness of this world. Those are the things that we are called to dwell on. And we have those provided to us in the word of God. Everything goes back to the word of God. Next one. Whatever is lovely. This is a term that is not often thrown around much these days. Whatever is lovely. I can't think of any situation that I have actually in earnest called something lovely. Yeah, I can't. No, never have. But it could also be translated as pleasing or gracious, something beautiful, something, something lovely, something very nice to dwell on, nice to look at. We are called to dwell on the things that please the Lord and bring a heart of graciousness in us. There are things in this world that God has created that could very easily be defined as lovely. I look at Simple things like a gorgeous sunset. We were looking at the clouds coming up here and just the way that God shapes and forms them just because he wants to. It's so lovely. I'm going to start using the term more, actually. I'm still, it kind of rolls off the tongue. <laughs> yes, yeah. There are things in this world that God has given us that are very, very pleasing. 
and he is a good God that loves to give good gifts to his children. And we are right. We are right to call such things lovely. Next. Church, we as Christians are called to dwell on whatever is commendable. Commendable. We are to focus on the things that are held in high regard, that have good reputation, that are able to be commended to others as good or right. You should think about this. You should do this. You should dwell on this because it is commendable. It's good. It's right that you should do so. These are the things that are thought well of and considered commendable not by men, but by God. Practically, just for means of an example, these can manifest themselves in virtues that I think all Christians should emulate. Commendable virtues like graciousness, courtesy, humility, patience, hospitality, courage. All commendable attributes of the Christian. All things that we should be able to look at as Christians and say, we need more of this because it makes us more like Jesus. Commendable. Paul wraps up verse 8 with this statement. He says, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Now, all of these things that Paul has listed up to this point as things that the believer should be constantly dwelling on, all of them can fall under these banners of being excellent, being worthy of praise. Paul calls us Christians to think about these things, strive for these things, surround your mind with these things, dwell on things that cause you to, to that, that are able to be defined as these things that he has laid out. And for us as Christians, and again, this is a testament to the grace of our Heavenly Father, there are many things in our lives that can fall under these banners. God has given us Many gifts, many things that are worthy of praise, many things that are lovely, many things that are commendable, many things that are honorable, many things that are true. And he has given us many ways that we as Christians can experience the joy that comes from enjoying these things. I think uh, often, I know this was the case for me, uh, especially when I was very new coming into um, uh, reformed theology, confessional theology is, is one of the things that we as confessional uh, reformed Christians really love is feeling horrible. <laughs> we love the doctrine of total depravity. We're totally depraved and we're proud of it. And we struggle with having joy in the gifts that God has given us. And it's something that I know I have struggled with, but something that the Lord has been gracious to show me, that here are simple good gifts that I have given you, that it is right for you to revel in, right for you to have joy in. Joyful relationships, your spouse, your children, that vacation, that new car that you were able to buy, a good sports game, good food, Good times with people. There are so many gifts that God has given you. And it is right and good that we enjoy them as Christians. Because in that enjoyment, we can then give God glory. Say, Lord, thank you for this good gift. Thank you for the joy and the happiness that it brings me. It is a good and right thing for us to do that. It is not a bad thing to find joy or to dwell on the good blessings that God has given us. But it is important that with that being true, and I believe, I believe this is the point, all of these attributes that Paul has listed, truth, honorability, justice, purity, loveliness, commendability, excellence, not only are we as Christians supposed to be dwelling on them and filling our minds with things that fall under these, but we should also be dwelling in them. And this is the orthodoxy, orthopraxy that I've been speaking of. There's, there's, there's a difference between understanding the truths behind what Paul is talking about 
and living in light of the truths, living as if we believe it is true. This is what Paul preached and lived his entire life. This is what he modeled for the church in, the, in, in, in Philippi, for all of the churches that he planted, and for us as well here in Cedar Willie in 2022. We are called in verse 9 by the Apostle Paul to what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Paul says that the, that, that the Philippians have seen these things in him. Not only has he spoken the truth to them, but his life has modeled the very truth that he confessed to them. They are able to see the joy that emanates from the Apostle Paul, not only in his writing, but also in the way that he lived. Paul calls them to emulate him, just as he emulates Christ. And he calls us to do the same. And one of the questions that I have this morning, and something that I asked myself often going through this passage in preparation for you, and something that I still in no way means have, have under my belt, but can the same be said of us as followers of Christ? Can I say, honestly, if I'm going to take true, real, honest inventory of my life, that I can say like Paul, you see how I had joy here in this situation? You should emulate me. Right? Now, it might seem like a very arrogant statement to make, but all of us as Christians should strive to have lives that are able to be emulated. Strive to have lives that, that look like Jesus so that when people look at me, they don't see Josh. They see Jesus. All of us should strive to have lives like this. Can my life, my thoughts, my actions, my thinking, can it be characterized as pure? Can it be characterized as commendable? Can it be characterized as lovely? Can it be characterized as being worthy of emulation itself? And I confess to you, my friends, that that answer changes sometimes multiple times a day. Some days I think I'm doing all right. And some days, boy, I don't feel like I'm a Christian at all. How do we get to this point? Because I want it. I desperately want it. I want that life that's able to be emulated. I want a mind that is more prone to dwell on what is good and what is lovely than what is wrong and frustrating. I want that. I think first, it requires that I am submissive to the authority of Scripture, that I am immersing my life and my mind in the words of God because we were all discipled by something. And what I give the most time in my life will be my closest discipler. And there is so much in this world that wants to pull your thoughts Pull your affections, pull your, your loyalty away from the word of God and onto this or other things in our culture that pull us. I must be submissive to the authority of scripture. I must allow it to both encourage and to cut And it is a hard process. Sanctification is often not an enjoyable process. The removal of my flesh and the putting on of Jesus Christ is often not an enjoyable process. But it is one 
that is necessary. And it is one that leaves me at the end looking more like my Savior than I did before. The more we are in the Word of God, the more the Word of God will be in us. And I believe that is the point. Most importantly, I believe that we must understand that all of this striving, all of this effort, all of this trying to live according to the word of God and to dwell on the things that are good, that are right, that are commendable, all of that will be utterly hopeless if it is not rooted in the correct and right foundation. It's one thing to be dwelling on the good blessings that God has given us, which again is a right and good thing to do. But is it a completely different matter to dwell on the one that embodies these characteristics perfectly? That is a completely different matter altogether. There is nothing in this world that will bring peace to the weary heart or the raging mind most sufficiently than the Prince of Peace himself. It must be paramount in our lives that we are to dwell on the one that embodies these characteristics. We will be discipled by something. Is it the news? Is it the podcasts? Is it YouTube? Is it politics? Or is it Jesus? There is no one in this world more true than Jesus. There is no one in this world more honorable than our King. There is no one in this world more just than the creator of the law itself, the one that carved the law into the tablets and gave them to his people. There is no one in this world more pure than the spotless lamb of Calvary. There is no one in this world more lovely than the rose of Sharon. There is no one in this world more commendable than the carpenter of Nazareth. And there is no one in this world more excellent or more worthy to be praised than the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords himself, the one seated on high at the right hand of God, interceding at this moment for his people, the one that is, the one that is to come, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, our King, Jesus Christ. No one. There is nothing in this world. All of the greatest blessings that we have on this world, although they are good and we thank God for them, they pale in comparison to the glory and the loveliness of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Church, if you are going to, to wage war against, against your mind, against your flesh, and bring it into subjection, it's going to take something stronger than anything this world has to offer. It's going to require a conquering king to take over your mind, bring it under subjection, and be seated on its throne. Our Savior, Jesus Christ, is above all worthy to be dwelled on. There is nothing, nothing more worthy than Jesus. And I ask you this question today, church. Have you found in him these things to be true? Have you found the person of Jesus to be commendable? Have you found him to be just? Have you found him to be lovely? Have you found him to be worthy of all praise and excellent? Have you found your sufficient savior to be good? Have you ever gone to him and found him unwilling to answer you? 
have you ever found in him a harsh master? Have you ever found him to be lacking in any way that you need? I haven't. And I never will. And any time that I begin to think that he is somehow less than what I need, it is because there is way more of me that I am dwelling on than him. Church, peace is something that our world desperately needs. We look around and we see a world at each other's throats. And peace can often be something that is not seen. That there is no peace on earth, no goodwill toward men. There is so much clamor over how peace can be achieved, where peace can come from, what we should be putting our hopes in. And church, I have only found one thing in my life that gives me the peace and the security that I'm desperately looking for. And I've looked in quite a few places. And that is the word of God. It is the sufficiency of Jesus Christ to meet us in our pain, to meet us in our anger, to meet us in our joys, to meet us in our sufferings, to meet us in our sin. It is our sufficient Savior that we as Christians must dwell on. Peace will not come to you without opening your Bible. Peace will not come to you without dwelling on the sufficiency of your loving Savior. We as Christians must put this into practice. Whether you just became a Christian yesterday, and if so, welcome to the family. Or if you have been a Christian 50 plus years, it stays the same. Your mind must dwell on Jesus because he is good. He is commendable. He is lovely. He is just. And all the things that we find in God's word as good and worthy of excellence, worthy of praise, are found in the person of Jesus Christ. You want peace, dwell on Jesus. You will never, ever find him lacking. You will never, ever find him absent. And the peace of God will be with you. Would you please pray with me? Father, we are a very, speaking for myself, frightened people a people with many cares and worries and fears. Father, we live in a world that bombards us with information, bombards us with opinions, infiltrates our minds and tells us how we are to think, tells us how we are to feel. And the still small voice of your word is often forgotten. But Father, we thank you that you are gracious to meet us even in our failings, even in those times where we are swayed and pulled and, and discipled by something other than your word, you still remain steadfast. You remain constant. You remain faithful. Father, please give us the grace as your people to take inventory of our lives, to see, to, to identify the blind spots that are there, to ask ourselves, what are, we, what are we allowing to disciple us? And anything that is not of your word and of our Savior, Father, may we root out. May we tear down the high places in our lives so that you might receive the glory even more. Father, you are so good to us. We thank you so much for the grace, just the grace to be able to live this life. Father, we pray your blessing on us, your people. Please give us peace. Father, please give us assurance. Please renew in us a sense of, of understanding of how 
tight you hold us as your people. And that you promise to never let us go. Father, we thank you for Jesus. Please keep his excellence on the forefront of our minds. Please give us the courage and the grace to make this so. We come before you a redeemed and thankful people. And we do so being ushered in by our Savior. Amen.